Chapter 13 Day followed after day in Partha with no end to Odysseus' task. It was not that he could not sense the forces stirring within most of those who came to him, but that their progress beyond that did not leap forward as his and even Lilia's had done, mystified Odysseus. He spoke of it with her, as they lay in bed in the elegant quarters granted them by the generous Master Ethan. But Lilia seemed not at all bothered by the lack of results. It shows that you are even more special, my love, as I already knew, she cooed, her hand running over his chest. But give it a few more days. I think you will begin to see what you desire. I'm glad you think so, he returned morosely. I also appreciate it more since I know you weren't happy when we found ourselves here instead of nearly in Kajan. I am, if nothing else, very adaptable, dear Odysseus. I have been forced to be. Odysseus would have questioned her remark, but when he looked at her again, it was to discover that Lilia had just drifted off to sleep. A few minutes later, he fell asleep too. For the next few hours, happily relieved of his concerns. The noblewoman's prediction came to pass barely two days later. By this time, Odysseus had touched nearly everyone in town. There were astonishingly few people hesitant about awakening the gift within themselves, and fewer yet that he could deny. It was Master Ethan who suggested those who should be forbidden time with Odysseus. They were criminals, all the most suspicious and untrustworthy. As lead justice of the Parthen Tribunal, the merchant knew most of them by face. He made certain to stand by Odysseus once he knew what was happening. That man there, Ethan had declared, be wary of giving him anything. He then pointed to another. He's likely to set your throat while you greet him, so watch that one too. In the beginning, Odysseus had dutifully obeyed, but on this day he saw again the first man in question, an unsavory, bearded soul by the name of Romus. A wicked scar ran across a good portion of his bald pate, a result, no doubt, of his nefarious activities. The moment that Romus saw that he in turn was being observed, he started to leave. However, Odysseus suddenly decided that he wanted to speak with the disreputable figure. Romus, Romus, come to me. Hundreds of pairs of eyes fixed on Romus. He had no choice but to step forward, despite scowls from the town guard and many others. Master Ethan, too, was not pleased. Odysseus, I, I know you mean well, lad, but such as him would be more of a danger if given the gift. Lilia put a soft hand on the merchant's arm. But, dear Ethan... How do you know that some others like Romus have not already received Odysseus' aid? Can you claim to know every villain walking in Partha? Uh, no, my lady, but I know a damn lot. Pardon my saying so, and this one's among the worst. She would not be dissuaded. You have seen the faces of those who have been awakened. You yourself have experienced it too. Look deep. Do you think that you could ever use it for ill? Ethan faltered. No, never, but... No one could, Lilia insisted. No one could. Not bothering to wait to see what his host might say next, Odysseus reached for Romus, who looked less like a threat and more like a frightened child. The bald man was surrounded by a good many townsfolk who considered Odysseus something of a holy figure. Don't be afraid, said Odysseus. Odysseus to the crowd, he added, Give him some room, it's all right. As they obeyed, the son of Diomedes drew him closer. Romus frowned, but let himself be guided. Still at Mather Ethan's side, Lilia leaned forward, her gaze intent. The rest of the townsfolk watched warily, Romus's reputation apparently well known. They were ready to defend Odysseus if anything happened. But Odysseus himself had no such fears. The moment that he touched the other man's hands, the force within him surged forth. Odysseus immediately felt it stir something within Romus. 
The bald man gasped, and a look of wonder spread across his face. It made him look like a completely different person, one whom Odysseus would have trusted with his life. It's... it's... Roma stammered. Yes, it is. Odysseus stepped back, as ever giving the person a chance to come to grips with the change themselves. Romus chuckled like a child, and a tear slid down his cheek. With both hands, he rubbed the top of his head, and he tried to comprehend. As the hands came away, Lilia abruptly called, Odysseus, see what he's done? Look at the scar! Odysseus could not look at it, for it no longer existed. The skin where once the jagged cut had lain was now as healthy and as pink as that on Jonas' restored face. And it had not been because of any effort by Odysseus. That was not immediately apparent to the townsfolk who applauded this latest work of his. Quickly raising his hands high, Odysseus waited for the crowd to quiet, then shouted, What you see was none of my doing, none at all. What you see before you, the miracle you've witnessed. Romus did himself. When cries of denial arose, he grew more stern. I say this, and I know this. Who here would call me false? No one there could. Many began looking in amazement at Romus, who shook his head over and over, trying to deny the truth as much as his neighbors had a moment before. But Odysseus would not let him. Romus, come join me here by the fountain. Let the others see. Wordlessly, the bearded man obeyed. Others crowded forward, murmuring to one another and pointing at the healed area. Romus began to turn a deep shade of crimson. There was nothing about him that looked like the hardened criminal Master Ethan had first identified. Uncanny, muttered the merchant from the background. Is it possible? Lilia clutched their host's arm tight. It is, she breathed to Ethan. Do you understand now? Yes. Yeah, I suppose I do. Meanwhile, Odysseus had gathered the people's attention again. It may be some time before anything manifests again, but you see now what is possible. Let no one doubt that everyone will be able to do the same, and more. That was enough to send the throng into a roar. Many fell to their knees and thanked Odysseus, who looked extremely upset by this reaction. He did not... Get up! Get up, he insisted. His fury shook his followers. They stared fearfully. He did not care. They had to understand. No one bows to me. I'm no king, no patriarch of a mage clan. I was, and still am, a simple farmer. My lad, my home, may be lost to me. But that's what I remain, even with what I've been granted. I offer to share, not to command. Never ever kneel to me again. There are no masters here, only equals. Even as he said it, Odysseus knew that they did not entirely see it that way. They would look to him for answers, for direction. He consoled himself with the thought that he acted as teacher, as guide. One day soon, most would no longer need him. There was even the possibility that some would surpass Odysseus and that he, in turn, would have to learn from them. For the time being, though, it was all up to him. Romus's startling act, though, gave him renewed hope. Each person was individual. As a farmer, he understood how growth varied. All he had to do was be more patient. He had the time. Kejan was not expecting him. He could stay here until he was certain. That would make it all the better when he did present himself to the inhabitants of the city. Feeling better about matters, Odysseus turned to the next supplicant, and the next, and the next. Malik was being more cautious this time, not because he felt any concern about facing Odysseus, but because he wanted the mission to go very cleanly. The Morlu could be a double-edged sword in some respects. They were very capable, but their tendency for bloodshed almost rivaled that of demons. Fortunately, the master had chosen a capable servant in Deimos, and Deimos had chosen well his five warriors. Collectively, they were a far more potent force than the demons and guards that the cleric had led previously. Deimos even now stalked ahead of the party, sniffing the air like a beast on the scent. 
the other Morlus sat eagerly in the saddle, awaiting word of the prey. This way they came, grated Deimos. He raised his ram's skull helmet up to the sky and sniffed again. And in this place they turned. That way. Malik's gaze followed the outthrust arm. Are you certain? The lead Morlu grinned, revealing sharp yellow teeth. I smell the blood, High Priest. They were heading toward Kajan. When last I encountered them, they were well on their way to the lowlands and the jungles. Veering off in that direction means an extreme detour. Deimos shrugged. To his kind, such considerations were unnecessary. All that mattered was where the prey could be found, not what direction it had run before the hunt. The cleric stroked his monstrous arm, a motion that had, in the short time since the transformation, become an unconscious habit. The clawed fingers twitched. Just before the party had left, the master had finally told them what the hand could do. Malik was now eager to try it, but to do that, he had to reach his quarry. We go that way then, the high priest finally declared. Grunting, Deimos returned to his dark steed. That following the trail was what they needed. To do was very obvious to all the Morlu. But they knew their place, and so did not make anything of the cleric's unnecessary comment. The high priest could send them to their deaths if he so desired, so long as it served the temple. They would not question his leadership, unless commanded to by the master. With Malak in the lead, the band rode on at a furious clip. Curiously, their mounts left no trails of their own, and, indeed, even the clatter of hooves was missing. Had there been any other person there to witness their passing, they might have noticed that the hooves did not even quite touch the ground. Night settled again upon the town of Partha. An exhausted Odyssean fell into his bed. He barely noticed Lilia slide in beside him before sleep overtook the farmer. Dreams soon invaded his slumber. Pleasant interludes in which he was able to help the sick and maimed everywhere learn how to heal themselves or bring burnt lands back to bloom. Odyssean watched the world become a paradise and its people reach a point of perfection undreamed. Then, in the midst of the harmony and love, calamity broke out. Fissures opened to the ground, and even the sky developed cracks. It was as if his home was hidden inside a vast egg now, being broken open by something outside. And in the next breath, the heavens filled with fiery winged figures, and from the fissures rose monstrous scaled hordes. The two fearsome armies immediately collided with one another, with humanity caught in the middle. Men, women, and children were torn to bloody gobbets by the unnoticing warriors on both sides. Thousands lay strewn dead in an instant. Stop, Odyssean roared, stop! None of the combatants paid heed to his cries, and when he sought to use his gift to make them listen, nothing happened. They're all over us, shouted Achilles, suddenly at his side. Do something, I'm almost out of arrows! Indeed, the archer had apparently managed to bring down nearly a hundred of the fighters, but still the tide flowed toward where Odysseus and he stood. This is your fault, Achilles insisted, growing angry. Your fault! No! Odysseus whirled from the hunter, and his accusations only to find Cerinthia gazing at him from afar. She stood surrounded by a sea of furious warriors, oblivious of the surmounting threat to her. Blades already slashed past her head, but all Cyrus's daughter did was continue to stare at Odyssean as so many in the audience had this day. I have faith in you, she declared. I do. An axe already scarred from heavy use neatly severed her head. Blood poured forth like a fountain from the open neck. As Cerinthia's head toppled over, Odyssean saw that the look of trust yet remained. Sari! he choked. Odyssean tried to push forward, but a hand suddenly pulled him back. He looked at the one preventing him from reaching her and discovered it to be none other than his own brother, but a mindon of the likes of which made him shiver. Do not worry about her anymore, the cadaverous figure intoned without emotion. 
Mandelin's face was drawn and gray, and he seemed half shadow. A dark cloak surrounded him, a cloak that twisted and turned despite no apparent wind. Do not worry about her anymore. She's one of mine now. Only then did Odysseus see that there were figures behind Mendeln, faces he recognized from both Partha and Serum. However, they, like Mendeln, had drawn faces, and when he looked close, jagged wounds and torn flesh. They were all dead. Having made his declaration, Mendeln drifted past Odysseus as if a shade himself. In his wake, the corpses of the innocent rose to follow. The fighting separated around Cerinthia's body, which still despite its death. Mindeln gestured, and the torso also turned to join him. Wait! called Achilleo, sleeping forward, throwing down his bow. He seized Cerinthia's bleeding head and rushed after Mindeln. Wait! Odysseus attempted to follow, but for him, the battling legions would not make room. The winged warriors and their bestial adversaries pressed tight against one another, yet, despite heavy losses on both sides, the numbers seemed undiminished. An endless flow of replacement continued to come, filling the world to overflowing. There was no longer even a hint of the paradise that had once stood all around Odysseus. The ground was a blazing slaughterhouse, the sky burnt and smoke-ridden. Then... When he had nearly given up hope, he heard Lilia's voice call to him. Desperately, he looked around for her, at last spotting the noblewoman, her finery gleaming, gliding toward him from across the carnage. The battle did not touch Lilia in the least. In fact, the combatants seemed eager to be out of her way. She ran directly into Odysseus' arm, holding him tight as he held her. Lilia! He gasped, relieved beyond belief. Lilia, I thought I'd lost you too. But you will never be without me, my love. Never. She cooed, holding him tighter yet. Her face was planted in his chest. We are bound to each other forever. Grateful, Odysseus leaned down to kiss her. Lilia raised her face to his. Choking, he tried in vain to disengage from the noblewoman, but Lilia's embrace was unbreakable. Odysseus stared in horror as her mouth moved closer to his. Will you not kiss me, my love? She asked with a smile. A smile filled with sharp teeth. Her eyes had no pupils, merely a sinister shade of crimson covering the entire area under the lids. Her skin was scaled, and her ears beneath her hair long and pointed. The hair still hung long, but now consisted of harsh quills colored emerald green. Despite the macabre changes, there was that about her that still filled Odysseus with desire, a desire so deep that it frightened him. The grand dress that she had worn was gone, utterly gone and all those similar scales covered her flesh, they did not hide what the human garments had often hinted of. No! He blurted, shoving her back with all his might. No! Lilia laughed at his antics. Her tail, which ended in three dagger-like projections, slapped merrily against the bloody soil. She took a step back on hooved legs, like those of the goats Odysseus had kept on the farm, and displayed herself fully for his eyes. Am I not everything you dreamed? Am I not all you desire? The demonic woman laughed again, and then, though the laugh sent chills through the hapless farmer, it also heightened his desire for her. Come, my love, Lilia continued, her clawed hands inviting him toward her. Come, you are mine, body and soul, soul and body. Come to me. As she said this, the armies suddenly halted their struggle and turned to face Odysseus. They marched slowly toward him, their steps matching the rhythm of Lilia's voice. Body and soul, soul and body, body and... With a wordless cry, Odysseus woke up. He twisted to find Lilia stretched over him, her face, her beautiful face, filled with concern. 
Odyssean, my love. Are you ill? I saw the others. You... Planting his face in his hands, he slowly pulled himself together. I, I dreamed. Dreamed, that's all. Nothing but a bad dream. A nightmare? Lilia reached a smooth, unclawed hand to his cheek. Odyssean instinctively flinched, recalling her appearance in the vision. And what a horrible nightmare it must have been, she added, if it makes you so afraid of me. Lilia, I'm sorry. She shook her head, letting her loose blonde hair cascade around her naked form. Even shadowed by the darkness, she was arresting. Desire again filled Odyssean, and the foul dream began to slip into forgetfulness. Snaking her delicate arms around him, Lilia whispered, Let me help ease your mind. Let you see that you have nothing to fear from me. Lilia, I... Hush. Their lips met and stayed that way until Odysseus was well out of breath. As he inhaled, the noble woman giggled, a sound not only extremely pleasant, but not at all like the seductive yet mocking laughter of the nightmare. And that is just for the beginning, I promise you. Her hands caressed his arms, ran over the hair on his chest, and worked their way down. The last vestiges of the dream faded with a playful growl. Odysseus lunged forward and filled his arms with her. The two of them rolled to the other side, where the son of Diomedes worked relentlessly to make certain that no memory of the vision would ever return. When Odysseus again slept, it was in a mood that could only bring him enjoyable dreams, not nightmares. With lusty snores, he lay on his stomach, one arm draped casually over Lilia. But Lilia did not sleep. Lying on her back, she stared without blinking at some place in her own memory. A place far from bed and Odysseus. There were many among humanity who believed that dreams were portents, and Lilia knew that they were not far from the truth. Dreams could be portents. She knew that better than most. Throughout their lovemaking, Lilia had managed to gather little snippets that Odysseus did not even realize he mentioned. Those combined to create a vision that had caused her at one point to nearly forget herself. Fortunately, her powers had quickly healed what would have, under other circumstances, left the farmer with a deep and hideous scar on his back. Yes, dreams could be portents, and there was that possible aspect to Odysseans. However, there was another reason for them, one that concerned Lilia far more. Dreams, and nightmares especially, could be warnings too. Lilia knew just what those warnings concerned. What she did not know was the source. She had done her utmost to veil her presence to those who would recognize it. To be sure, they now had their suspicions, but they too had to tread carefully. To not do so would reveal the entire situation to the high heavens. No one, not even he, desired them to discover Sanctuary's existence. Which still left her at the advantage, at least as far as she could see. But this dream continued to disturb her. It did not sound like an attempt by any of those who would seek to prevent her from fulfilling her goal. Yet, what else could it be? It does not matter, she told herself. She was mistress of the situation. She was the one who had awakened the power of the Nephilim and the fool beside her, and through him, she would raise it up in every mortal possible. Nothing would stand in her way. And if Odysseus Oldiam had failed at some point to remain a docile puppet, then Lilia would simply kill him and find another dupe. After all, there were so many men. There you have it, folks.